sounds great. Um, okay, so uh, so first of all, you know, it's a it's a true pleasure and honor uh, to to be invited to speak to uh, to the the students and you know, obviously, Peking University uh, amongst the best of the best. And uh, I saw a few of the resumes, and they look exceptional. So uh, we've got lots of horsepower in the room, which is great. Um, and uh, behind me, I don't know if you can see it, but behind me is a bust of Charlie Munger. And uh, so Charlie will be overseeing the proceedings uh, for the next couple of hours. So uh, in case we go off track, he'll get us right back on track. And um, so, um, so anyway, you know um, what I what I wanted to do is the the topic for today is um, uh, the quest for ten to hundred baggers, and this this term hundred baggers uh, actually comes from Peter Lynch, uh, and it means uh, making a uh, hundred times on your investment, or making ten times on your investment. So if you say ten baggers, it's ten times. Hundred baggers is hundred times. And um, I haven't given this talk before, uh, which is always a lot of fun for me because it's very boring if I have to repeat uh, uh, some talk that I've already given before. So uh, in some ways, you guys are guinea pigs, but in other ways, I think it'll be exciting. And because I have not given the talk before, I'm not exactly sure of the timing, uh, but I'm gonna try to move this along because there's a lot of material uh, uh, relatively fast, uh, so uh, so it'll it'll feel like it's going pretty quickly. But that's why we have the recording. So later you can um, watch it uh, kind of more at your leisure if you want to. Or certain parts, uh, but also certainly during the Q and A we can go through uh, things that uh, you have an interest in. So um, anyway, I started my journey um, as a value investor. Uh, 22 years ago, and I uh, quite by accident uh, heard about Warren Buffett for the first time. And unlike you, uh, when I heard about him, I was 30 years old, so I was much older. And uh, and when I uh, when I read about him, I was really stunned. I basically so I I have I haven't been to business school. I'm an engineer by training. Um, all of you probably know a lot more about finance than I do. Uh, but but I was really stunned uh, with Warren Buffett's approach and the way he had been so successful. And uh, the crux, the crux of his success, at least what I took away from what I read in 1994, was uh, a quote by Albert Einstein, which is uh, compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. And um, And so even though Einstein was a physicist, he actually figured out a few things about uh, about compounding, and um, you know, obviously in '94 when I had read about Buffett, he had been compounding at the rate of about 25, 26 percent a year, and 26 uh, percent is a magical number. Uh, and I thought it was a magical number then because if you compound money at 26 percent, it doubles in exactly three years. Uh, so if you if you have a thousand dollars, you compound at twenty six percent, you're going to have two thousand dollars in uh, in three years and so on. And um, if you if you go for thirty years, uh, that's two to the power of ten. And this group doesn't need me to tell you that two to the power of ten is one thousand twenty four. So we throw away the twenty four. It's a thousand times your money. So if you had a thousand dollars and you compounded at twenty six percent. Uh, 30 years later, you would have a million dollars. And if you had a million dollars and you compound at 26%, 30 years later, you'd have a billion dollars. And that's basically the key uh, to, to Buffett's success. And so I wanted to, I thought it was worth trying to uh, uh, do what Buffett did. Of course, no, we're never going to have another Warren Buffett. But I thought it was worth trying to uh, compound at high rates. And so I actually gradually over five years switched from being a CEO of an engineering company to eventually being a, a, a hedge fund manager. And the key, the key uh, uh, nuance or you could say mental model I used was 
a very simple, which is I, I looked for companies that were selling for half or less than what they were worth in two or three years. So if I could find a dollar bill for 50 cents, then what that meant is that if it got valued as a dollar in two years or three years, I would be compounding at 26%. And if it happened in two years, it would be even higher. It'd be like 35, 36%. And if it happened in two years, it'd be 26%. And so I said, you know, it's worth trying to seeing if we can find these 50 cent dollars because 26% sounds high, but find, finding things that are half off in an auction driven market um, is not, I didn't think it was that hard. And I thought it was worth trying because the rewards are so high. And uh, so that's what I embarked on doing is I said, okay, let's try to find these, you know, a dollar bill for 50 cents. And then you just sit back and wait for two years or three years. And, you know, markets are weighing machine in the long term and uh, they'll get reweighed accordingly. And uh, for the most part, if I, if I look at my, uh, my performance from 95 uh, until uh, let's say 2014, uh, it's, it's done about the 26% approximately. Last two years, I'm down about one third. So it we're taking it down a little bit. Uh, but, uh, but we think in the next few years, we'll make it up. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I'll report to you next year when I'm with you in person. And, um, but, uh, but this journey, this, uh, it's been uh, 21 years since I started doing this. And I had a million dollars uh, in 1995. And I wanted to try to see if that million in 30 years could convert to a billion. So I said, okay, basically uh, we have the million. I don't really need it for anything. I'm going to try to put it in this Buffett engine of compounding and I want to see what happens to it. And the good news is that even if I miss by 90%, it's still a big number. Even if I miss by 95%, it's still a big number. They're all acceptable numbers. So it's it sounded like a good game to play. And uh, when I first set up my uh, the first set of stocks I bought in uh, 1995, and this is, you know, I had one year of experience reading about Buffett. I didn't have a lot of experience. Uh, I hadn't uh, gone to business school, et cetera. And uh, so I, I uh, basically used to just, uh, if I found a company, I would make a 10% bet. So my portfolio of a million stocks basically got a uh, million dollars got divided into 10 stocks, okay? And um, so I bought these 10 stocks, but then I had, a, I had an interest at that time in making uh, investments in the Indian market because there were some companies I had noticed in the Indian stock market that looked very compelling. And uh, it was very complicated at that time in uh, 94, 95, to invest in India, especially as a US resident. And uh, for example, they didn't have DMAT. So if you bought shares, uh, this is like 21 years ago, they gave you physical stock certificates. And also the Indian government said that if I brought in dollars and I bought Indian stocks, I'd be able to take the money back without taxes back in dollars. And the country had a lot of exchange controls. So I didn't actually believe them. You know, I was a little skeptical uh, that a country which had all, all these exchange controls would kind of honor these things that they were saying, if you will. And uh, so I was skeptical. So what I did is out of the million dollars, I only allocated $30,000 to India. And the $30,000 I allocated to four stocks. Uh, so I had to physically go to Mumbai. I opened a brokerage account, opened the bank account, and then I bought these stocks. And then a few weeks later, I got these physical stock certificates in California and they were almost falling apart. Like they looked like they almost were worthless. They looked so beat up. And um, so one stock I bought, which was half of the 30,000, 15,000, uh, was an IT services company. That was the business I was in and uh, Satyam Computers. And then three others, there was one, uh, one was a broker through whom I bought the stocks and two were courier companies. You, you know, kind of like FedEx or uh, DHL, 
because India had very bad uh, postal system. So I thought that as the economy grew, these uh, these companies that were basically uh, doing what the postal system should be doing, but are doing it in private ways, like FedEx and DHL and UPS. Um, so, uh, and I, I, I thought these were all very long-term plays. So when I got these certificates, I said, okay, I'm gonna stick them in my drawer and not look at them for 10 years, just let them be. But what I noticed is after about five years, uh, one of the stocks, the IT company, Satyam Computers, I had bought it for 45 rupees and it was trading at 7,000 rupees. It was up 130 or 140 times what I paid for it. And, um, and at that point, actually, I'd been tracking it a little bit, but I, I, in about 1999, uh, which is about four years after I bought, I said, you know, let me just study this business again because I know the business, but this is ridiculous, you know? And I noticed that the, uh, the multiple it was trading at, it was trading at more than 100 times earnings. It was just ridiculously overpriced. And one of the reasons it was priced that way is because they had spun off a dot-com company, which they still owned a piece of. And the market at that time was in a major bubble uh, for all these dot-coms. So this company, which was just a, you know, system integration IT company had formed a, spun out a subsidiary, uh, which was doing some nifty things on the web. And the market gave that spun out company a huge valuation. And because of that, this company got a big valuation. So anyway, I thought this was complete bubble territory. And I I was also concerned the 15,000, the exchange rate had moved against me. The 15,000 was worth over $1.5 million. Um, so, you know, I started with a million dollars. I'm going to tell you what the remaining 985,000 in a second, but 15,000 of the portfolio was sitting at one and a half million. And I was concerned whether the Indian government would allow me to take the money back, whether I could even sell the stocks, whether the shares were fake or real. I had a lot of questions. So I said, you know what, we're going to test this out. So I contacted the broker. I said, I'm ready to sell these shares. And I sent them the shares, they sold the shares. I sold within 5% of the all-time high of that company. And uh, they put the money in my Indian bank account. And then the next day I asked them to wire it to the US and they wired it. Everything went flawless, exactly as the government had promised, no issues, okay? I was blown away. I said, wow, no taxes. I gave them 15,000. Five years later, they're giving me 1.5 million, no questions asked. What a country. And um, and then uh, these other stocks that I had, they were all kind of, you can say, old economy stocks, okay? And they hadn't done much. So the remaining 15,000 maybe was worth 20,000 or 25,000, had, had not moved much. In fact, everything else was going down in price at that time, except the frenzy for the dot-coms. Even Berkshire Hathaway, hit a multi-year low at that time. And um, so in 2001, uh, I decided to completely exit my Indian positions. And I sold all the, the remaining three. One of them uh, was down 50%, but the other two, we made a little bit of money, but basically for the remaining 15,000, I got like 20,000 back or something. And the overall result in India obviously was more than acceptable. You know, 30,000 in, one and a half million out is perfectly fine. Then the other 970,000 I had, there was one company I had in there which went up 100x. And I had $100,000, this US company, CMGI, uh, went up a, a 100x. So that one company became 10 million. And uh, so now I had 10 million in that one company. I had the one and a half million in this one Indian company. And the rest of the portfolio had done okay because at that time from 95 to 2000, the US markets had gone up like 25% a year. So that it had moved up, but nothing like these other companies. So I had like, you know, I think 13, 14 million dollars out of the million dollars in five years. And I said, Monish, forget about 26%. We've just kind of blown it out of the park very well done good job i was very happy you know it was a fantastic job especially for never never having even attended 
a single class of the professor at Peking University, just you know, winging it on my own, if you will. And um, now, recently, I went back. So what happened is these other stocks, when I went to sell them, the other three Indian stocks, they told me one particular stock certificate was fake. So it was a very small amount of shares, but they said it was a fake certificate. And the broker said, we're not responsible for fake certificates. So I didn't really care. It was a small amount. And I just kept that one certificate in my, in my desk. And recently, I looked at it again. I said, no, it doesn't look fake to me. So I sent it again to a broker in India to sell. And I asked them, can you sell these 100 shares of this company? So now what had happened is I had held this one company, Blue Dart, which was like the FedEx of India, for 21 years. And I held it for 21 years by accident because that one little piece didn't, didn't get sold because of this, uh, uh, because of this uh, uh, kind of fake thing. And I trace back what, because I kept getting these dividend checks all this time and all that, that uh, blue dart uh, was ultimately a 60X. So if I had kept those shares, I had, I had invested in blue dart, I had invested uh, $7,700. And I would have had uh, about half a million uh, if I'd kept those shares. So then I went back and said, let me check all the four stocks in India. What, what happened to the other three if I had not touched them? Because they were designed to not be touched. I was stupid. I sold it after six years. So what ended up happening is that Blue Dart was 60X. There was another one, Kotak Mahindra, which was my broker. That was up 50X. And the third one, uh, which was Skypack, which was a competitor to Blue Dart, that basically went down to half. That didn't do anything. But what ended up happening in that portfolio of 14 stocks in 1995 is I had uh, I had four out of the 14 that all eventually went up more than 50 times. And uh, in one of them, I had a serious position. I had a 10% position, which completely altered my net worth. And, and then I, I started thinking that, you know, uh, this, is not, uh, this is not good that I ended up with these companies in my portfolio and I never recognize how great they were. I recognize it in two cases. In two cases, I was able to. Now, in one case, I, uh, in fact, in both those cases, both the cases I, I, um, cashed out the 100X were both bubble because of the bubble, not because the valuations went up. They probably should have been worth 10X or 15X, but not 100X. But so we over, uh, we kind of collected more than we should have, which was fine. But but these other ones, these were real businesses like the FedEx of India, uh, the, the Goldman Sachs of India. And these were businesses I should not have sold. And I sold them. And so I started, I started thinking, how often has this happened in my portfolio? How often has it happened where we had these uh, companies where we, I was smart enough to buy them, uh, but not smart enough to hold them? And why is that happening? So what I, which is the subject of the talk today, is kind of a framework. What I dis, uh, did is, so, you know, the best way to learn is to teach. So I have to admit that one of the reasons I wanted to do this uh, this talk and this lecture is because I'm trying to learn. So whether or not any of you guys learn anything from me, I am definitely going to learn from this talk. Because what I want to do is I'm 52 years old. Hopefully I have another 30 or 40 years left. And in the next 30 or 40 years, when these 100 baggers show up in my portfolio and they're guaranteed to show up, uh, I am at least smart enough to figure out that some of them are 50 baggers or 100 baggers, and I hold on to them and I not sell them. So, so what I did is I said, okay, how do we identify multi, multi, these 100 baggers? And what I discovered is that if I just looked at the examples in my own portfolio and obvious examples around me, there are basically about uh, six, um, I'm sorry, there are about five different categories that these 10 to 100 baggers fall into. Now, it could be more than five, but five is the one I was able to come up with before it was time for this lecture. Um, 
If I come up with more, I'll update you next year. But we at least have five very distinct kinds of companies which should give us clues that these are businesses uh, that we want to hold on to. So the first, the first uh, category of companies that has the potential for these 10 to 100, 100 baggers is these are businesses which have huge tailwinds. Uh, tailwinds means they just have all the all the factors moving in in their favor. They have very deep moats. They have very long runways. They have very high return on equity. They typically don't need any debt. And uh, the most important condition, an idiot can run these companies. So uh, like Warren Buffett says, invest in businesses that an idiot can run because one day an idiot will run them. So which are the companies that a complete moron, stupid idiot can run? Okay, so these are the businesses like Seas Candy, Coca-Cola, Moody's, Visa, MasterCard, American Express. These are the types of businesses which are so deep in the moats that it's, uh, in fact, you know, if you look at a company like Coca-Cola, they have more than a hundred year history. And uh, in the 100 plus year history, for several decades, the company was poorly managed. And uh, you have a company in, in China, uh, Mao Tai. Uh, maybe some of you even consume the product. Um, with due respect, I think Mao Tai probably has great management, but with due respect to Mao Tai, an idiot can run that company. Okay, so you do not need anything between your years. You can put me in charge of Mao Tai and I can run it. Even a person like me can run that company. That is an unbelievable, fantastic business, okay? So there's a good friend of mine, you might've heard of him, his name is Guy Spear, and uh, he lives in Zurich, and I think he's gonna try to also speak to you next year. Maybe we'll both come together. Uh, we'll see if we can uh, do back-to-back -back lectures. So Guy has a mental model he uses, and his mental model, which he's used actually for more than 15 years, is that if he identifies a company like Moody's or S&P as a great business, or let's say if he identifies Coca-Cola as a great business, or let's say the Coca-Cola bottlers as a great business, what he does then is he looks around the world for Coca-Cola bottlers in other countries. So if he finds that, that being a Coca-Cola bottler is great in Tennessee in the US, then I want to find the same business in Brazil I want to find the bottler in China. I want to find the bottler in India. And I want to go around the world looking for the Coke bottler. And I want to find which one is being undervalued. And then I want to invest in it because the economics of these Coke bottlers, no matter where in the world they are, is about the same. They all are great businesses. So one of the businesses, which is the ultimate, ultimate deep mode business is Moody's. You know, they do the, um, uh, the, uh, the debt ratings. And even in the financial crisis, when they gave all bad and flawed and garbage debt ratings, it still did not destroy the company. This is a great business that an idiot can run. And um, so, uh, so Moody's, guy, guy said to himself, what are the credit rating agencies all around the world which have the same business model like Moody's? Because Moody's is a model where they'll hire an analyst, they pay him maybe $100,000. For each analyst they pay 100,000, they are probably collecting $4 million in fees. It's just a great business. Uh, so just the economics are fantastic. Um, so he found a company in 2001 in India, which was a very small, but was a number one credit rating agency in India, exactly like Moody's was in the US. And he found that S&P, S&P 500, owned 10% of that company. So S&P had done a lot of due diligence and they bought a 10% stake in the company. That company was called Crystal. And so Guy Spear, at that time, he was managing about 30, 30 40 million dollars. He made a small investment in Crystal. And uh, it went up, it doubled or tripled in two, three years. And then he bought a little bit more. And then uh, another year or two later, he sold it all. He had made like four times his money. So sometimes I like to pour salt on the wounds of Guy Spear. Like sometimes I want to have fun with him. 
I, I, I spoke to him last night when I was preparing the talk. I said, hey, guy, you know, that crystal position that you owned, which you sold, if you had not sold, uh, it, it went up 130 times after he sold, okay? And he's actually the kind of guy who doesn't even trade that much. He just buys and holds. Uh, so I said, hey, by the way, you know that crystal you sold uh, back then? Why did you sell it? He said, Monish, don't remind me. That's the dumbest thing I did. Because basically, if he had kept crystal, he manages 160 million. The crystal position would have exceeded the entire portfolio he has today. One, one, one decision. And, and what was so hard about that decision? Well, it wasn't hard. They were a replica of Moody's. I already told you an idiot can run Moody's, just like an idiot can run Coca-Cola. And, uh, and idiots have run it, and they've not been able to destroy these businesses. And so the first thing to do is when you run into businesses that idiots are running or can run, and they still continue to be in business, buy those companies if they have these characteristics, and then forget the P ratio. Just buy and hold forever because probably those are very, very few businesses on the planet. And uh, like I can almost bet, uh, bet that maybe 10 or 20 years from now, Maotai looks very different, very different. But it's hard to tell the path it takes, but it looks like a great business. So that's the first one, uh, the, the, the businesses that idiots can run. The second is exactly like the first, except these cannot be run by idiots. So these are businesses which are exactly like the first kind, which is they have huge tailwinds, they have deep moats, they have ultra log runways, they have high ROE, they don't need any debt, but they need great management and they do have great management. So these are businesses like Amazon, Costco, Geico, Amor Pacific, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, the one I bought in India, which went up uh, 60 times or something. Blue Dart, which is the FedEx replica I bought in India, Satyam, the IT company, then Restaurant Brands, which is the one that owns, owns Burger King and Tim Hortons, McDonald's, Yum Brands, Domino's Pizza. Uh, these are all great businesses, but they, need, they do need uh, solid management on top of them to make sure that they keep those franchises. But, but these businesses have economics that are just phenomenal, just, just great economics. So that's the second type of business um, you want to keep and look for in your portfolio. And you get these massive runs, uh, as we saw with Blue Dart and others in India. Then the third kind is uh, the ones which have shown up the most in my portfolio. So I have never had the good fortune of having the first kind of business, which is huge tailwinds and idiots for management. I've never had that. If I ever if I ever get that in my portfolio, uh, we're never going to sell those. We're going to keep those forever. Um, now the third one is when the market gets confused between risk and uncertainty. And uh, so what I want to do over here is I want to go through some examples from my my own portfolio in the past. In some cases, I was able to capture the upside. In other cases, I was too stupid and I missed the upside. I, I made some money, but I didn't make a lot of money. So the first company I want to talk about, and sorry, these are not businesses you, you may have heard of, but uh, that's the nature of this game. The ones that are going to be 100 baggers, uh, they're not going to be the, the, the biggest names around that you've heard of. So in, um, in 2005, I invested in a, uh, a steel company in, uh, which was based in Canada. Uh, they were traded in the US called Ipsco. So Ipsco made two types of steel. They made plate, plate steel and they made tubular steel, you know, kind of like uh, pipelines, uh, drilling for drilling um, uh, oil wells and all that. So they made these uh, kind of the specialized steel, which was either in pipe form or plate form. And, uh, the company had the following characteristics when I invested in it. The market cap was two and a half billion. They had 900 million of extra cash on the balance sheet. And the company had contracts on the book because there were these pipelines that were going to buy their steel for the next couple of years. So they had a two year backlog 
where they knew that their earnings for the next two years were going to be 650 million each year. So you had a two and a half million dollar, two and a half billion dollar market cap, and you had 2.2 billion between cash they already had and then cash that was coming in in the next two years. And so you would collect about 90% of the market cap in cash in two years. And after two years, you still had all the plants and equipment and people and all the know-how, everything was still there. But after two years, there was no visibility into earnings. And we know the steel business can go up and down. So the way I looked at it, I said, you know what we're going to do is I'm going to make a bet. I'm going to put 10% of my assets into this. I'm going to just sit there for two years. And if it doesn't work, we probably get back 90% if the company is completely gone. But I don't think it's completely gone. I think it's got a, it's a, it's a real business. So what happened is a year later, they made the 650 million. And the year later, they had visibility for one more year. And now they said that they would make 650 million for the third year. So now they had three years of 650 million, which was almost 2 billion plus the 900 million. So now we were above my purchase price. So the stock that I bought at 45 a year later was sitting at $70. So I said, well, we are above what we paid, but we still don't know what the business does after three years. Why don't we just wait for another couple of years, see what happens, okay? So in 2007, I waited one more year, and by now the stock had gone to maybe 100 or $105, and they got a buyout offer. Another company came and bought them for $160 a share. And when that when the deal was announced for $157 something, I sold the stock. And so we ended up with almost a 4X in about two and a half years, okay? And we captured the entire 4X, right? And so this was a situation where uh, it's a highly, highly cyclical business and markets markets hate uncertainty. It's a highly uncertain business, but the risk, the risk for this business was very low. So it is what I call very low risk and very high uncertainty. So when you find a combination of low risk and high uncertainty, usually that combination is going to give you a high reward because uh, markets are not very good at pricing in uncertainty. Uh, they hate uncertainty. And uh, so we get some benefit from that. And, um, and, and in fact, there's a, there's a business in my portfolio currently, and I don't talk much about my portfolio, but I'll just make an exception because I love you guys so much, uh, is, uh, uh, I own a company called Fiat Chrysler, which is based in uh, uh, partially in Italy and partially in Detroit. And um, Fiat Chrysler is very similar to Ipsco. So uh, the stock is at six dollars or uh, and change. And the management of the company says that in the year 2018, their earnings are going to be around five dollars. And so if if the management is correct about uh, the future prospects of the business, then basically the business is being priced at 1.2 times earnings for, for one year. And so my, my answer to that is, okay, we'll hold the stock till 2018. Uh, if, if it's completely worthless as a business, I mean, they have 130 billion in sales of cars. They just started manufacturing Jeep in China. The Chinese love their Jeeps. Raise your hand if you think Chinese love Jeeps. All right, at least a few Chinese love their Jeeps. That's great. Uh, so, so their Jeep sales are going up like five times in the next three years in China. Um, but anyway, so I happen to think that what they are saying makes sense. The, the, the market thinks it doesn't make sense. So no problem. Just like IFSCO, we put the stock in the portfolio and forget about it. And uh, I'll wake up in January 2019 and see what happened. And if you invite me back in 2019, I'll tell you what happened uh, uh, to, uh, to Fiat. And, between us girls, we may end up 
with uh, five times our money if it trades at five times earnings or seven times our money if it trades at seven times earnings and um, and such so that's uh, that's it score then there's another company uh, uh tesoro petroleum and uh, this is one which we did not capture but we should have but we didn't so tesoro uh, you know ipsco is in the in the steel business tesoro is in the oil refining business um, they have they have oil refineries in the united states and in the united states in the last 30 years not even one new oil refinery has been built because of nimby you guys know what nimby is not in my backyard nobody wants the oil refinery near them so in the entire us anyone who wants to build an oil refinery they never get the permits so the oil refineries that we've had for 30 years 30 years ago are the same ones we have today and um, they keep trying to tweak the oil refineries in the us to get more and more capacity but they're not able to build new ones um, and so anyway, Tesoro had a bunch. So the oil refining business in the U.S. actually is a is a pretty good business. And the reason it's pretty good is because all the different states have different requirements for how the gasoline or petroleum is to be produced and the the amount of emissions and all that. So you need different refineries for different states to meet the meet the standards, which makes it difficult for other competitors to come in. So even though oil refining may be a commodity business, it's not really a commodity business because it's got these uh, kind of local aspects to it. Um, so anyway, what happened with Tesoro is that there was another merger taking place with two large oil refiners. And in order to make that merger happen, they were forced to sell one of the oil refineries to make the merger happen. Tesoro bought that refinery they leveraged their balance sheet to buy that refinery. And after they leveraged the balance sheet, the crack spread, spread, which is the spread that refiners get to make crude oil into gasoline, the crack spread narrowed to almost nothing. So their profits went to next to nothing at the same time when they had a huge amount of debt. And so markets looked at the debt and they saw a lot of uncertainty because it is very hard to predict the crack spread. So just like the uncertainty of steel prices, the, uns the refining margins are always uncertain. And markets project present circumstances to infinity. So markets said, hey, the crack spread is small. It'll always be small. They have all this debt. They may not be able to pay the debt. What happens if they don't pay the debt? Well, what happens if they don't pay the debt is they have many refineries. They can just sell a refinery. They don't need to go bankrupt. They can just sell some assets and they can get out of the jam they're in. So I looked at the, the company, the balance sheet, the, uh, the debt and so on. And the stock was at seven and a half dollars. It had gone, gone down a lot. It used to be at almost $30. It had gone down to 25% of the price. So I bought 10% of assets at seven and a half dollars. Three months after I bought the stock, it, was trading at $1.33. So the 10% the of assets I put in, just this alone took my portfolio down by 8%, this one position. But uh, one of the things that always happens to me, but it only happens to me, it doesn't happen to you, is every stock I buy goes down first. And it always goes down. I don't know why it doesn't go down before I buy, but they all go down after I buy. Somehow it knows, and, and you know, Bruce Berkowitz is a uh, is a fund manager. He calls it premature accumulation. So I always have premature accumulation. And um, anyway, so 750, we're down to a dollar 33. We're used to that. We're not going to sell anything. We sit there, and then a few months later, the crack spread widens, and they're paying down debt, and the stocks at 15 dollars. And I said, hallelujah, from $1.33 to 15, 10 times, from 750 to 15, double, less than three years, still on track for 26%. We are out of here. Or like Anand Schwarzenegger would say, hasta la vista, baby, sold the stock and moved on. Now, what I didn't realize is that Tesoro had a phenomenal manager, Bruce, Bruce Smith, 
just a kick-ass manager. And he was just a master at extracting value from these refineries. He bought pipelines and refineries when the uh, financial crisis took place. And if if I had if I had uh, kept Tesoro uh, from the bottom tick of a dollar thirty three, it went up two hundred times till today. Okay, so. From the time I bought, uh, it went up about 40 times. Uh, so I only captured a double, okay? But the rest of the ride, I completely missed because uh, what this guy was able to do was he was able, he was a master at buying these assets, uh, you know, extracting more value, getting more, uh, uh, get, getting more assets. They spun off a pipeline company a lot of things uh, they did. He delevered the balance sheet and all of that, and and it just even now I think it's uh, uh, it's done really well. So that was an example of a low risk, high uncertainty business where uh, I already knew in the period I owned the stock that I was dealing with an exceptional manager because in the conference calls I was in love with Bruce Smith. He was just a great guy. He was uh, doing all the right things, but we missed that. We missed that uh, 40x, and there was a chance to get a 200x. And uh, then we are going to go to another one, which is a shipping company. All these wonderful businesses, you know, uh, steel business, refining business, uh, shipping. And you, you know, you thought you can only make the money on Alibaba and Baidu. No, you can make the money without Alibaba and Baidu. Um, you can make it other places. So, for example, Frontline was a shipping company. And um, this uh, this company basically um, focused on uh, transporting crude oil. So they had something no, known as uh, VLCCs, very large crude carriers that they owned. And uh, the global fleet at the time I invested, I haven't looked at the shipping business lately, but this was uh, an investment I made, I think in uh, around 2000, 2002. There were about 400 VLCCs in the world, and uh, Frontline was the largest amongst all of them. They had about 70 of them in their fleet. 70 out of 400 were owned by Frontline. And this is the ultimate high uncertainty business. The VLCCs go are, 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 are chartered two different ways. Either they are time charters or they are daily charters. The entire Frontline fleet of 70 ships was on daily charters. And the daily charter rate for these ships can vary from $5,000 a day to $300,000 a day. It is a huge variance. And at that time, I don't know what the economics are now, but in 2002, once the rates went below 12 or 13,000, they were not making any money. They were losing money. And uh, once the weight rates went over 30 or 40,000, they were just super, super normal profits, ex ex exponential profits. But the exponential profits, you didn't know what would happen the next day because every day these prices fluctuate. But there was a particular nuance in the shipping business that I understood. And I understood this because a friend of mine in the real estate business had explained this to me. He said that, you know, when you build these large office towers, uh, it takes in the US, in China, it's probably much faster. But in the US, it takes three to five years to get the permits and actually build these, you know, 20, 30, 40 story buildings. And so what happens is that when um, office space is very tight and fully occupied, all the real estate developers rush out to build new buildings. And they all rush out to build new buildings at the same time. And the banks finance all of them at the same time because everything looks great. It's a boom business. They can see 100% occupancy. And then five years later, all these buildings come on the market at the same time. And what happens is the occupancy and the rents collapse at the same time. So in these, in these kind of high-end office buildings, you have this boom and bust cycle of uh, you know very uh, high occupancy and then low occupancy then high occupancy and low occupancy just keep going back and forth because the uh, the property developers just think whatever is happening right now 
is the way it's going to be forever. And the people who are in the shipping business are even worse than the property developers. They believe everything that's happening right now is the way it's going to be forever. So what happens is that when these VLCCs are trading at 200,000, 250,000 a day, they all go to the Korean shipyards and place a huge number of orders for ships. Okay, and they, they say, build me the ships. Same like the building, it takes three years or four years or two years to build the ship. By the time the ships are built, all these ships get delivered at the same time, those rates collapse. And then they go scrambling again and they got a bunch of bankruptcy. So the business goes through these ups and downs. Now, one of the things that happens is that when rates go to 5,000 a day or 10,000 a day, scrapping of ships increases a lot because they're losing money and they, what they do, they take the old ships and just scrap them. So they, they make some money. So the, the size of the fleet goes down at the time when the rates are low. And as the fleet size goes down, it sets up the conditions for rates to go up. And then when the capacity goes down, the rates start going up, you cannot bring in more capacity because it takes three years to build a ship. So the only thing that can happen is price goes exponential. So anyway, I bought Frontline at a point when these prices were at five or 10,000 a day and the stock had collapsed and it was trading at uh, uh, something like, uh, I think at about uh, $6 a share. And just like with uh, Tesoro, a few months, a few weeks after I bought it, it was trading at $4 a share, lost one third. Not as bad as Tesoro, but one third is gone. And then, uh, it went from $6 to $9 in a short time. I wanted to just capture that spread. It was above the liquidation value of the company. I sold the company. Anyway, because of the very high uncertainty in rates, this, this company, if I had held the stock throughout, even with all the recent collapse in shipping, um, it, it would have been a 40 times investment from four to uh, 160. Uh, I'm sorry, not, not 40, it'd be from 6 to 160, about 30, 35 times my money. So um, another company which I just wanted to talk about is uh, Tech Cominco. And this is, again, um, low risk, high uncertainty. So during the financial crisis, um, commodity prices collapsed in 2008. They went to nothing, right? And this company, Tech Cominco, is like the IBM of mining. They have huge reserves of metallurgical coal and huge reserves of um, of uh, uh, of iron ore and um, and you know lots of trade with China and such, but they had done an acquisition just before the financial crisis, large acquisition. They had taken a bridge loan to close that acquisition. Then the financial crisis happened. They couldn't refinance. All the prices collapsed. And this stock went from $50 to $4. It dropped by more than 90% in seven weeks. And when I looked at the company, it's again like the refineries. They had all these different mines and assets all over the world. Some of them were the lowest cost mines you could imagine. And the banks did not want to take over this company. The banks don't want to be in the shipping business. The banks were probably going to do what I would call extend and pretend, which is they would you know, take some uh, fees and penalties from them, but they would extend their loans. And anyway, uh, uh, in fact, uh, China came in as an investor in Tech Cominco, and uh, and uh, and uh, in a few months, the stock was up seven times, and I sold. Uh, so we bought at four or five dollars. We sold at thirty dollars. And then it kept going, it went to $50. So we didn't capture all of it, but we captured most of it. So anyway, that was the uh, third criteria, which is the, um, the low risk, high uncertainty. Then the fourth criteria is uh, what I call ba bankruptcies, reorganizations, uh, public, public LBOs, special situations. So how many of you have heard of Sam Zell? Raise your hand if you've heard of Sam Zell. At least one person, the professor. Well, you know, I think you should extend an invitation. Uh, you should extend an invitation to Sam to come speak to your class. Sam is called the Grave Dancer. He uh, he dances on the graves 
of companies that are left for dead. And uh, if you get a chance to invest with Sam, generally speaking, it's going to go really well. So uh, Sam, you know, Warren Buffett, Sam Zell, and the Pritzkers, these are some of the very best people on the U.S. tax code. They know U.S. tax code better than anyone else, way better than Donald Trump. Um, uh, they really know the tax code. And, um, and I don't think Sam Zell um, has ever sent a, a much of a tax bill to the U.S. government because he's just so efficient with the way he runs his tax affairs. Um, so anyway, there was uh, this. This story is a interesting story, but it goes back. It goes back about 26 years. So in 1990, there was a insurer called Mission Insurance that, that went bankrupt. And when this insurer went bankrupt, they had 630 million in NOLs, net operating losses. So these net operating losses that the company have have a lot of value if you can bring that shell company into a company that has profits because you can shield 630 million of profits because of that because of that uh, that loss so sam was able to buy that company for like 30 million you know because it had nothing other than the losses and you have to find something to uh, so he bought the 630 million of losses for 30 million uh, about 7 8 years after the bankruptcy this, this was in uh, 98 or 99 and then there's another investor, Marty Whitman from Third Avenue, who also bought some of the shares in this mission insurance. And then they went looking, the two of them went looking for a profitable business that they could join with this operating losses so that they would suddenly have no taxes on the business. And they found a, uh, a, a barge shipping company on the Mississippi River, you know, like Tom Sawyer uh, on the Mark Twain on the Mississippi River. Uh, they found this barge company, which used to send, uh, you know, goods up and down the Mississippi, and it was profitable. So they said, okay, we'll buy the barge company, and now the barge company is not going to pay any taxes because we got these NOLs, and that's how we'll make our money. And then what happened right after they bought the barge company, uh, the barge business went to hell. So the rates collapsed, and the barge company went bankrupt. So they now had bankruptcy to the power of bankruptcy. And I don't know whether you teach them, Professor, how to calculate bankruptcy to the power of bankruptcy, but it's not good. So there are two bankruptcies now instead of one. So instead of having 630 million in NOLs, they now had 800 million in NOLs, even higher. So then they went looking for another company that they could buy so they could take both these things and pair it together. And um, so they had a company called Danielson Holdings that was trading at $1 a share. And then they found um, a waste to energy recycler. Uh, so what this company does, it's a plant where you put garbage in, in on one end and you get electricity on the other end. It's a German process. And there's a bunch of these plants in the US which convert waste uh, materials, garbage into electricity. And the, the economics of this purchase was this company had $2 billion in assets, it had $2 billion in debt, and they bought it for $30 million. okay? And uh, so it, had, it, it was very highly leveraged, but it had this kind of energy business, and they thought that they could um, tie it in, and so they, they tied it in, and then they needed some capital, so then they started to do a rights issue. That's when I found them. So the stock was a dollar, by the time I was able to invest in them, it was at $9. So it had already gone up like nine times. Um, and then uh, they did a rights issue. They did two rights issues. They bought another company. And basically in about 13 months, I had a double and I sold. Um, you know, and, uh, and basically uh, if, if, I had kept, if I had kept the position, that was about it was about a 40x uh, from uh, from that dollar price they had, and about a 4x from where I had bought. And so, as you can see, you know, we have all these companies that are in these weird places. Uh, they're not great businesses, but they do really well. And then the final uh, one I want to talk about, which is uh, 
the fifth model is upside without downside. So uh, I also call this playing the bubble. So what happened in in um, in the you know in the late 90s, the dot com boom was on in a big way, and everyone thought it's going to be transformational. It's going to change everything. So these companies like Pets.com, et cetera, they had huge valuations. You know, even Amazon was a huge valuation, Yahoo, all these companies. Now, I, I had spent some time in technology. I knew that the internet was important, but I also could not tell which company would make it, which company would not make it. And I was definitely not interested in buying anything uh, which was even trading at 10 times earnings. You know, I like to buy things at three times earnings or even better like Fiat, one times earnings. That's even better. So, so I was not interested in buying these businesses, but there was a bank, there was a bank in Silicon Valley uh, called Silicon Valley Bank, really good bank. And it was a normal bank, except that they had one thing. What they did was, see in Silicon Valley, what happens is that if you are uh, uh, a landscaper or a gardener, for Google, they'll give you stock options. If you are a chef for Google, you'll get stock options. If you are a waiter in a restaurant, they'll give you stock options. Stock options is like breathing in Silicon Valley. So this company, Silicon Valley Bank, whenever they made loans to uh, all these dot-com companies, besides getting all their loan terms, they always got warrants. And the companies didn't care, they gave them warrants. So every time they would do some loan or some deal, they would get these warrants from these dot coms and they never disclosed how many warrants they had, what warrants they had, what the strike prices were, no disclosure. They only said that we just get warrants. So there was an unknown element to what these warrants were worth, but the bank itself was trading at a very low valuation, just slightly above book value and a very well run bank. Even now it's in existence, it has done well over the years. So I said, okay, this is the way to play the bubble, which is buy Silicon Valley Bank. And if those warrants turn out to be useless or worthless, we don't lose any money. We still have the bank. And if they turn out to be something, then we have a, a huge, huge run. And, um, and basically I think we had a, uh, we had a two and a half, uh, yeah, we, we made about two and a half times our money in two and a half years on the on the stock. And if I had held it a little bit more, another year, I would have made five times the money because then they disclosed the warrants just as the 99, 2000 bubble was peaking. And then they started selling those warrants. So they monetized them, which worked great. And then the other company, which was the first company in my portfolio that went up 100X, was a company called CMGI. And they were an incubator of internet businesses. and I bought them just slightly above book value because at that time people didn't fully understand what that business was doing. So they just kept taking stakes in dozens and dozens of, of internet companies. And then they had a whole basket of them. And then the markets fell in love with these kinds of companies. So they took it to the stratosphere. They took it, our 100,000 became 10 million. And I sold almost nearly at the top. I think uh, maybe 20, 30% off the top I, I sold. And uh, so this is kind of something that comes into play um, when you have bubbles. It's probably not the most elegant way to make money, uh, but sometimes you can get these upside without downside situations uh, when that can play out. And and with that, those are the kind of the five models. Uh, you know, so we have the huge tailwinds with the idiots who can run the company and the company does well. Then the second is a huge tailwinds, but you cannot have idiots. You need smart people running it, kind of like Amazon and Geico. Then the third is markets get confused between risk and uncertainty. Uh, so we talked about Ipsco, Tesoro, Frontline, and Tech Cominco on that. And the final one was the Grave Dancer, Zell. You know, bankruptcy, reorganizations, public LBOs, busted LBOs, special situations, um, and uh, and those can those can all work out uh, quite well as well. And, and then you finally have the upside without downside, uh, which, which has happened only once to me because they have the most mega bubble I had in 22 years was in the late 90s with the dot-coms when uh, 
most of you were still, I think, uh, maybe not even in kindergarten, but maybe just in kindergarten. So uh, with that, I think we can uh, uh, talk about what you want to talk about. Thank you very much. I feel excited. I think I'll quit my professor job and go into <laughs> real investment. So there are my, many uh, hundred beggars in Chinese market. I truly believe. But yeah. I just don't have time. Okay. Now I open the floor to the uh, students to uh, ask questions. This is one very valuable opportunity. <clears throat> okay. So every word may worth uh, like uh, quite a lot of money. So if you have a question, just press the button push. Uh, for the speaker in front of you, uh, if the light goes bright, then you are on. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your insightful speech. Uh, the question I want to ask here is that: uh, What do you think is the core competence of an investor? And how do one investor actually differentiate from the huge investor group? Thank you. Okay, well, uh, I think that's a that's a great uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, the the number one skill set uh, that an investor needs to have uh, is extreme patience. And in fact, one of the things I learned when I was putting this talk together is like if I look at a company like Blue Dart, which was the FedEx of India, I held the company for six years and it didn't do anything for six years and I sold it. And it it had its run in the next 15 years and um, there was no good reason to sell it. So uh, the number one skill set is patience. Um, so if you are the kind of the kind of person who loves to watch paint dry, uh, then this is the business for you. Uh, if you love to watch paint dry, and um, and so if you are a hyperactive person who's always looking for action, uh, this is not the business for you. And uh, so I think that that uh, in many ways the investment business is a strange business. I think it's a it's a business that is best for uh, people who are what I would call gentlemen or general women of leisure, where they have some other activity, which is their primary focus, and investing is a secondary focus, so that they don't have uh, a compelling reason to act. Uh, usually investors hurt themselves every time you, tr you trade. So uh, Charlie Munger says uh, that you don't, you don't make money when you buy a stock, and you don't make money when you sell a stock. You make money by waiting. And in fact, what some of the things I talked about today uh, show us is, uh, is the, the huge advantages uh, that once you, once you, you know, you only learn about a business after you own it. So if you do analysis of a business before you own it, you may know something about it, but you're really gonna know more about it after you own it. And uh, that's when you have an opportunity to perhaps understand which ones have truly multi multi bagger possibilities and are the ones that you should not touch uh, and uh, and uh, and just let them play out for long periods. So patience is uh, very important, and that's what separates people. And in fact, one of the things about stock markets is uh, they're deceptive because if you look at a, a uh, the the market or the the invest the board which shows all the stock prices, you see them changing all the time. All the lights are changing and flashing. It all the signals it's telling you is to be active. It gives you all the signals to do something. And what you have to actually do is ignore all that. So one of the things, for example, one of the rules I follow is I do not submit any orders when the markets are open. Anytime I'm trying to buy or some, sell something, I usually sell it, send it at this time, well, after midnight to my broker to execute the next day. Because there is no price changes taking place. There's nothing taking place. Everything is calm. 
And then during the time when the markets are open, it's very rare that I will trade. I, I basically avoid that. So you can set up some um, tricks, if you will, to help you because everything is everything is designed to make you be active. You know, your broker does not make any money if you don't buy and sell stocks. You know, if you just buy one company and just keep it forever, they never want to make any money. But it's good for you, it's not good for them. So all the signals are the wrong signal. So uh, patience is the number one. That's what I would say. So my question is, uh, among the five categories that you mentioned, what, what's your proportion like? How much do you, uh, in your portfolio, how much do you put in these five categories? And what are the reasons for the same? Well, let me put it this way. Um, if you, if, if, you know, uh, Charlie Munger says that each of us has a very limited quota of stocks that truly have, may have the potential to make us rich. There are very few times that we're going to end up with things in our portfolio that are truly got the potential to make us very rich. And usually it is not apparent before you make the investment. Uh, usually it'll become apparent maybe after uh, you own the business um, for some time. You know, it, it takes some time. Uh, I mean, I, I I can think of many examples when I invested in the business. I thought I'll get a double and move on, but then I start to learn more about the business. So it's the wrong way to think about it by saying I want to put 10% in number one or 20% in number two or whatever this is an opportunistic business. So uh, you need to be very flexible. Like I said, the number one skill set is patience. What that means is it could be a long time before anything shows up, or it could be that five of them show up in one week. Uh, so uh, like, for example, during the financial crisis um, in uh, December 2008 and January, February 2009, there were so many ideas. Uh, coming at me that I literally had less than one or two days to process each one. Uh, whereas normally I will have weeks, even months to process an idea. Um, so, so it's not a good idea to do this top down. I, I have never done it top down. Uh, what I think what you need to be is you need to be kind of a bargain hunter. Uh, you go into a bazaar and you're just looking for uh, what looks exciting or cheap. And I'll give you the example of uh, kind of the difference uh, between um, Ben Graham and Charlie Munger. So Ben Graham will go into a supermarket and he'll look for what is the most heavily discounted item, deeply on sale. And then he'll buy that and come out. And Charlie Munger will go into a supermarket and look for the things that he loves. And then he keeps going back every day until what he loves has dropped in price. And that's when he buys it. So the Munger approach, in my opinion, is more superior to the Graham approach. And, and, but the Munger approach requires patience. And it requires you to understand what you truly like. And then you wait for the right opportunity. So it is a very good exercise to make a list of assets that you truly think are remarkable assets. And also make a list of what at what prices those assets would be interesting or exciting for you. And, uh, and when you have that list, then you just sit back and wait for the world to come to you. Uh, as opposed to taking my list and trying to go top down. The second thing about top down that doesn't work is um, it's very unpredictable when these things are available and when they are not available, and what is within your circle of competence, and what is not. So like, like the professor said, that uh, there are 100 baggers, I would say, in every market. Definitely in China, you have a huge number of 100 baggers at any given time. Uh, the problem is most of us do not have the ability to see it, because we don't either don't have the circle of competence or we don't have enough knowledge about the businesses. And uh, so this is a business where you want to be a student, you want to learn, you want to keep educating yourself. And every once in a while, there'll be a business that will show up in your portfolio 
uh, like I can I can think of right now at least three or four companies in my portfolio that could end up being huge home runs. Now, I cannot tell you which one. I don't know which one, but I'm willing to be patient and watch and let them let them play out. Because even if one of them is a 10x, it's worth letting that play out because they're so rare. So uh, that's how I would suggest uh, going about it. Uh, thanks for a great talk, uh, Mr. Pabrai. Uh, you spoke about the cyclical nature of the shipping industry. Um, so when freight rates are high, ship owners essentially order a lot of ships. And once they arrive, freight rates go down. Do you think the ship owners are going to learn from their mistakes? Or is this going to be uh, a problem that we keep on seeing in, the, in, in that industry? Um, the ship owners will never learn. The property developers will never learn. Um, humans and our genetic makeup isn't going to change in five years or 10 years or 50 years. So we vacillate between fear and greed. And as long as it, as long as there are humans driving action in industries like shipping, uh, you are going to see that vacillation. In fact, there's a there's a really, really good book. Uh, it's, it's, it's in fact a work of fiction. It's called The Shipping Man. I forget the name of the author, but I think if you Google it, you can find it. Uh, um, so The Shipping Man is a, uh, the guy was an investment banker uh, in the shipping business who wrote that, wrote that book. It's a really funny book because it talks about the Greeks. It talks about the Norwegians. Uh, it talks about all this kind of cast of characters, the Americans uh, in this business. It's funny as hell. And uh, and it really teaches you the business uh, while entertaining you. Um, so, uh, and that author has written a book to read. Uh, and in fact, uh, Frontline, one of the companies I invested in, is run by a guy named John Fredrickson, a Norwegian guy. And he has a character in the book who I think is a clone of Fredrickson, which is why I found the book kind of funny. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, the shipping business, I haven't looked at the shipping business in uh, in a lot of detail lately, but you know, it's, it's a challenged business right now. And what that means is there's probably opportunity in that business. But I would also say that uh, tread carefully question is, out of the five uh, strategies you mentioned require deep research in the business model, and to how much extent you rely on the open data source uh, to the public, and do you have any uh, unique or special channels for information to uh, help you to make the decision? Yeah, so all my data sources are open uh, because um, I am a very lazy investor. Uh, I never meet management. I never talk to management. Uh, I never travel uh, to see any plants or anything. Uh, I've never done that for any investments. Um, and um, and um, the results still work out. So um, so we're not we're not looking for superior information. What we're looking for is superior analytics on commonly known information. So, so for example, I, I mentioned the boom and bust of the shipping industry. And you know, the, the gentleman asked me about, you know, is that gonna change? Well, number one, it's never gonna change because we have humans involved and humans are hosed uh, on, on uh, the emotions. And uh, the second is that, uh, market participants, uh, we have two advantages against market participants. One is we have analytics, uh, which can help us because we have some understandings that maybe markets are missing. And uh, the second is that uh, we have patience. So uh, most investors don't have multi-year multi, multi -year horizons. They want, you know, I want to buy a stock at 10 and two weeks later I want to send it at 12. And then I want to buy something else at 12 and sell it at 15. And I want to keep doing that. Well, good luck. Um, if that worked, they'd be Warren Buffett. 
because the compounding rate would blow away Buffett's compounding rate. Uh, but clearly, we still have Warren Buffett in place. So therefore, that approach doesn't work. And um, so if you have the patience uh, and if you have uh, the interest to really dig deep, um, then you, what you're going to find is that with commonly held information or no, known information, you may come up with insights that others have not. So, you know, this is what Charlie Munger talks about, the lattice work of mental models, is you look at things through a different lens to try to see uh, what, can, what can be different. Like I would say that when my friend Guy Spear uses a mental model saying that if Moody's is a great business in the US, what other businesses are like that in the other parts of the world? That's a great model because you may be able to find a business in another part of the world where people have not realized what a great business they have. And, um, and that's why uh, these things uh, get to where they are. And uh, so, you know, like for example, uh, I think all my life, or at least all my investing life, I hated the automobile industry because it's uh, high capex, uh, it's unionized, you've got consumer tastes, and you've got uh, a lot of things which uh, are not, not good about the business. But when I studied the business for, I spent about one time, about six weeks studying the business, I actually realized that many of my underlying assumptions were wrong. Um, and, uh, and that the reason the auto companies had problems were for different reasons than what people think they have problems. So, I, I did not have access to any data that is not publicly known, uh, but I just synthesized it from many different sources to come up with some insights, and um, and those insights were helpful. So I think I think the thing is that if you are a curious person, and if you are a person who's uh, very deeply interested in business and how business works. Uh, and understanding uh, different business or industries, um, then uh, then you can do quite well. Right. Okay. Uh, I have a question that's related. So could you tell us a little bit about your lifestyle? How much time you spend on thinking about investment every day? Uh, because uh, <clears throat> the size of your asset and the management very easily place you into the one of the top ten. Uh, active stock funds uh, from China, and I know many of the, the, those uh, fund managers. That life is under pressure and very busy and uh, a lot of overwork. It's not a good lifestyle for those fund managers uh, who are managing the uh, uh, similar size of, of what you you manage. So, as well, you guys, how is the lifestyle different? You know, uh, I should not advertise this, but it's the best lifestyle you could possibly have. So, uh, you know, I I maybe have uh, three or four ideas in a year. Um, you know, sometimes we don't have any in a year, and sometimes we have many more than that, so it, it varies. Um, so if you follow the Buffett-Munger model, which I do, your life is going to be fantastic. So here's what happens in the Buffett Munger model. Number one, I have no staff. There are no analysts. There are no associates. If you send me your resume, I'll be excited to read it, but I can't help you with a job because there are no job openings uh, because we, we've never had a job opening. So um, one part of the Buffett model is that you do not delegate your investment research. So Warren Buffett, even today, uh, when he buys IBM or whatever he buys, he does all the work himself. Uh, he doesn't have anyone under him doing any of the work. There's no one building spreadsheets for him or anything like that. And that's the same thing at Pubri Fund. So I have, I have a few part-time admin assistants who are great. They help run all the any of the back office things if you have. But even there, we don't have much going on. So in a typical month, I don't get any phone calls or any emails from my investors, zero, okay? And I have about 400 families who have invested with me. And 
these families basically got selected because uh, I have very some very strange rules with how I operate. So, for example, before people invest, uh, I don't meet them and I don't do phone calls with them. So the only people who can invest are people who are willing to do reading of their own. We can give them access to our website. They can read various things. If it makes sense to them, they can invest. So that doesn't work for most people. But for the people it works for, since they invested the money without talking to me, uh, they really are not looking to have a lot of conversations even after that. And what I tell my investors is that we have a couple of annual meetings every year where they can come and they can ask any questions they want. And they come from all over the world. So, uh, so I have investors from everywhere and they show up at the annual meetings. And so in effect, we are open for business two days a year. Uh, and it's a lot of fun to meet them and talk to them. Um, so basically, if you don't have any staff, you don't have any HR problems, uh, and you have no issues. And what is the reason that Buffett and Munger don't have analysts? Well, the reason they don't have analysts is that the investment business is a very strange business. Uh, you need your brain at unpredictable times, and the rest of the time you don't need your brain. So if I, if I hired a super smart analyst, someone in the audience here, who I think each person here is exceptional, uh, that person would want to do something constructive with their lives. So they would either look to me to tell them what to research, or if I don't give them any direction, I'd say, listen, just go look and tell me when you find some great stock. Let's say I just tell them that. Uh, listen, you work on your own and just figure out when you have a great stock idea and, and bring it to me. Let's say I did that, for example. Well, what would happen is that because we have different circles of competence, 95% uh, of the time, whatever they come up with, I would say no to. Because 95% of the time, what I come up with, I say no to myself. And, um, and so since I would have liked this person when I hired them, I would feel really bad about saying no all the time. Because just, it'd just be unpleasant. And uh, so eventually I would give up and say, okay, I'll buy the stock that you want, even though I'm not sure about it. So, and then you've just destroyed the model. So what you have to do if you bring in people is you have to give them their own pools of capital. So they have full autonomy to do whatever they want and they don't come and ask you what to do. That's what Warren Buffett has done with Ted Wexler and Todd Coombs. He just gave them each 9 billion, they do whatever they want, they don't talk to him. That works. Um, so the, uh, the, when I look at investment operations, like you mentioned, a bunch of operations in China, et cetera, I look for violations of the model. So, you know, Moses came up with the Ten Commandments. We have commandments in investing as well. They come from the guy with the bus behind me and they come from Warren Buffett and they come from Ben Graham. They've written the commandments. And so one should follow those commandments. So when I look at an investment operation, um, the first question I ask is, how many violations are there? And the first place I look for violations is team size. So I can almost guarantee that the investment managers you're talking about who seem to be stressed out, uh, are not operating with a team size of one. Do they have more than one person on the team? Much more than one. <laughs> like, the, the yeah. like how many? Five, ten? No, different firms. They have different structures. Right, but right. Of course, so, the employee analysts, they also have assistants. Yeah. All sort so, of things. Yeah, so all that is hocus pocus. Uh, there's no need for any of that. I mean, the bottom line is, what is the model? The model is buy things, buy things at half off. And you have 5,000 stocks in the US and you have um, several thousand outside the US, in China, wherever. 
and um, we are bargain hunters. So why do you need a team to find bargains? You don't. And um, we didn't talk about it in this talk, but the simplest way to find bargains is to be a cloner. Um, and I am what you would call a shameless cloner. Um, I just, you know, I meet Lee Lu, and who's a hundred times smarter than me. I say, Lee Lu, can we meet for lunch? And every once in a while, I'll ask him, Lee Lu, what do you own? And in a moment of weakness, he'll tell me what he owns. And uh, then I just go, go buy it, and I'm done. And I don't even need to pay Lee Lu. It's great. Uh, so, uh, uh, and probably a better analyst than anyone I could hire. So, uh, and then in the US, we have 13 F filings where every quarter people have to file what they own. So just figure out who the smart people are, look at what they're buying, reverse engineer them. You don't need an analyst. It's actually fun. I think my job would not be fun uh, if I had, so, you know, um, many times by the time I get to the office, uh, half the trading day is over. I mean, in California, the stock market opens at 6.30 in the morning. 6.30 in the morning, I can assure you, I am drooling on my pillow. I am fast asleep. If I'm not sleeping till two in the morning, I'm not getting up at 6.30. Tomorrow morning, please don't tell this to anyone. This is just between us, okay? Uh, tomorrow morning, I will wake up at around 9 a.m. I may wake up at 9.30 a.m. There's no alarm. I'll wake up whenever I wake up, okay? And, uh, and there's no meetings because there's no staff. And uh, there's nothing on the calendar because that's what Warren Buffett told me, keep your calendar empty. And I have no idea what I'm going to do tomorrow. No idea. But I know it'll be an exciting day because I have so many books to read. I've at least got 30 books on my, uh, on my desk that I want to get to. So I'll pick some book if that's of interest. If some company shows up, I'll read about the company. If uh, I want to watch uh, a movie with my wife, we'll do that. Uh, whatever, man. I mean, the, the key is, the key to life is find Crystal, that's the Moody's of India, and then just go to sleep for 20 years. That's it. So the purpose of this talk is for me to understand that to become even less active, is not even wake up at 9.30 in the morning, wake up at two in the afternoon. Who cares? You know, because, uh, because we found Crystal and then the guy that Crystal would make all the money for us. So we don't need to do anything. And uh, so, you know, Warren Buffett says that it is not a good idea to get married for money, right? Usually if you marry someone because they are rich, that's a bad thing. Usually it doesn't work out very well. But it's it's a terrible idea to marry for money if you're already rich, okay? That's terrible. So the fund managers you're talking about, I would guess that they are fairly wealthy. Are they wealthy? Are they rich? Especially for the younger generation, uh, the young managers. Yeah, when they get promoted, go up the hierarchy and become pretty good. Yeah, so so the, the young managers, it's very simple. Uh, if you believe in the power of compounding, then a small amount of money on the side can get you to independence relatively quickly. Um, the analysts and the young managers and so on, I think the key is that you spend less than you earn you put something away, and then that little little something can become more and more, and eventually what you want to do is you want to be your own boss. So forget trying to chase the corporate dream. Forget all of that. Just, um, it, you know, it, I think one should only be in this business if you love this business. And the, in my opinion, the way to love this business, there are some rules. Number one, no staff. Number two, no trading during office hours. Number three, don't even go to work when the market is open. 
just be a gentleman of leisure or a general woman of leisure. And that's it. I was very lucky that I never worked in the investment business. I didn't even understand the investment business. I kind of stumbled upon it. And because I never worked anywhere, the only models I had was Warren and Charlie. And so I just looked at how, how did Warren run his partnership? I set up the partnership the same way. How do they run their life? Oh, he, if you look at Warren Buffett's calendar, it's completely empty. And um, so, you know, let's, let's keep it empty. And, uh, and let's do things that are, that are fun, you know? Like, like, I think like the reason I'm doing this talk is because it's fun. Number one, it's fun. That has to be fun. Number two, I want to get better at the multi-bagger. So I'm using you guys to pound into my brain to be even more patient, to be patient for 20 years. I never held a stock except that one stock by accident for 20 years. So I want to hold something for 20 years and get 100x on it. Uh, I want to do that. And it'll show up. It might show up when I'm 60 and we'll hold it till we're 80. And I hope that happens. I have another question on your opinion on the differences between uh, uh, value investor and uh, strategic investor. And we noticed that uh, many uh, Chinese companies took equity of overseas companies to help them to go into China, like the China Fusan uh, took equity of Climate, the Lamedian, uh, Climate, the very uh, big uh, tour, tourist and, and uh, hotel group and help Chinese customers have access to those hotels. And China Wanda acquire many good film companies in Hollywood. And of course they will make a lot of, uh, make a lot of money in China, in China's film industry. And we uh, often, uh, typically we assume that a uh, value investor uh, is an outsider of the business. They don't want to do anything to help the business. So uh, what's your opinion on being a value investor or being a strategic investor? Do you think you will get information on the, the movement, or the, the action of the uh, strategic investor and, and go behind with them? Like follow them, follow their, follow their equity taking? Well, um, I, I think well, I see, that's a really good question. And a question I've never thought about before, so it's a good question for, to ask because at least I can think about it. And I'll mumble some answer right now, but uh, maybe I'll think about some more and uh, next year might have a better answer. But uh, yeah, so, you know, Buffett says that I'm a better investor because I'm a businessman and I'm a better businessman because I'm an investor. So there is clearly uh, an interplay and advantage on those. One of the things that happens in... Um, with entrepreneurs or CEOs who are running specific businesses is uh, they have two things going on. One is usually their circle of competence is limited to that business. So if they're in the hotel business, they understand the hotel business. If they're in the shipping business, they understand the shipping business. And that, that competence can be an advantage because if they understand the movie business in China, uh, they probably have a better shot at understanding uh, the movie business in the U.S. than a person who's not in the business at all. So the domain knowledge is a huge advantage. The disadvantage normally that strategic investors have is they may not understand or they, not, they may not have a good understanding of value investing. So like, for example, a lot of companies buy back their own stock. Now, if you're in the hotel business, it means you understand the hotel business, which should mean that you should understand when it is undervalued and when it is overvalued. Most, most company CEOs are not really good at understanding when their businesses are under and overvalued. And one of the reasons they don't understand that is because if you are going to be a great leader, you have to be an optimist and you have to be a builder. And so you always see the grass as green on the other side. As a, and value investors are always skeptical. 
they're always looking for what is wrong. One of the reasons I sold all these companies much sooner than I should have is because I'm always skeptical about what might go wrong, for example. And uh, so there are different skill sets. So if, if you have some data which tells you that the CEO of the film company in China is a good capital allocator, then that can be a huge tailwind if you have some data that tells you that. So the thing that you have to evaluate is, are they good capital allocators? And they are, those are rare. So for example, obviously Warren Buffett is really good at buying companies. John Malone is really good at buying companies. Sam Zell is um, uh, really good at buying companies. Uh, so, uh, but lots of, uh, you know, the, the Japanese came into the U US markets in the 1980s and they bought all kinds of, real estate, uh, you know, trophy real estate all over the country, and they grossly overpaid for it um, because they looked at their experience in Japan where these properties were much more valuable because they were in a bubble. So they misunderstood what proper valuations were and they didn't do well, even though they understood uh, real estate in their own country. So I think that, that it's very, it's a good idea to follow the strategic investors into other markets if you can figure out whether or not they are value guys. They understand value. You know, like for example, the uh, the deal for Starwood. Uh, so I forget the name of the Chinese company, it was the insurance company that was chasing Starwood. And Charles Starwood is a very prime asset. It's a great asset. But I don't know enough to know whether that would or would not have been a good deal for them. They were clearly paying up significantly more than what the market had priced that company. Uh, so you would have to have an understanding of how those people think and whether they think correctly. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, all right, we reached uh, almost two hours. Uh, we will leave 20 minutes for our internal discussion to absorb what you said today. Uh, it's a great lecture. We have recorded. I myself will have to listen to it again. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, really motivating. Uh, make me think about the change of career. <laughs> right. All right. Yeah, and, uh, so, and I, I enjoyed it very much as well. And I look forward to seeing you guys in person next year. So even if you're not in the class, Maybe you can uh, ask the professor to let you in. Yeah, everyone's welcome uh, from this class uh, when you come next year. They will still be here, most of them. Uh, they're not graduating. Uh, and also, uh, we have recorded this lecture. We will send to you, and all you tell us that editor you are using, uh, so we can ask him or her to edit this uh, uh, lecture according sure. to our instruction. Okay, sure. uh, so I'll put it on the YouTube or um, China's version. Of yeah, it that sounds great. To a great. audience, yeah, great. Thank you very much, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, definitely we'll see you in person next year. That sounds great. All right. All right, bye. Now you enjoy, good evening, we give you a round of good applause. Yeah. <laughs>